the Asia Pacific Rural Development and Food Security Forum 2022. I'm Tom Pinella, uh, Director for Environment, Natural Resources and Agriculture in the East Asia Department at ADB. Um, and I invite you to this first technical session uh, of the forum on digital technologies for agriculture. Um, a few things to consider going into this uh, session uh, to set the tone is um, in the region, over 90% of the farmers are small holders and they produce 80% of our total food. Smallholder farmers face many challenges and have been in constant financial distress. Um, and COVID has exacerbated this situation. Um, and not only for the farmers themselves, but for the entire value chain, uh, put making many uh, vulnerabilities. Um, but that said, the, the pandemic has also helped accelerate uh, the adoption and uh, generation of digital applications uh, to agriculture, um, highlighting the potential to modernize agriculture and transform food systems and the value chain through digitalization. Um, the crisis gave rise to innovations that enabled uh, what we'll call agripreneurs to make direct connection with customers and even in regions where years of well-intended regulatory reform and support have failed. Um, so there is a, a positive outcome from the, the pandemic, but the question is, how can we sustain these digital uh, solutions catalyzed by the pandemic? Um, but it should be noted that these were ongoing anyway, but have just been accelerated. As we focus on the role of digital technologies in transforming food systems to offer increased profits to farmer throughout the value chain, we also need to highlight uh, the requ requirements to make the digitalization of agriculture happen. How are we going to do this? This includes uh, putting in place policy interventions, public-private partnerships, financing, infrastructure development, and capacity development, among others. Um, we will respond to these uh, issues uh, today. And um, to help uh, get us going, um, I would like to uh, invite uh, and introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Uh, Paul Tang, um, to give his keynote address. Paul is a uh, adjunct senior fellow at the Center for Non-Traditional Security Studies. Um, Nyang Technological University, Singapore, and current concurrently managing director, NIE International. He's a senior uh, advisor for AgriFood uh, to ASTAR in Singapore. He previously held leadership positions at World Fish, uh, the International Rice uh, Research Institute, so here in Manila or in uh, Los Banos, and Monsanto Company. Um, he has uh, researched and taught in North America, Africa, Asia, published 11 books and over 240 papers. Um, with this, I would uh, be very pleased to turn over uh, the session uh, to Paul to give his uh, keynote address. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tom. Let me just load my slides. Here we go. Can, uh, can you see them? It's good. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Presentation mode, please. Uh, yes, definitely. <laughs> Here we go. Is that better? Yep. What, well, thanks very much for the kind introduction, uh, Tom. And let me also thank the organizers for the opportunity to, to speak in this session. You know, the use of digital technology in agriculture ha has really exploded in, in recent years. And it's difficult in 15 minutes for me to do justice to all the potential applications. But what we do know though, is that uh, many of the problems that were discussed previously, you know, by the, 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 in the opening session are those that in fact lend themselves to digital technologies. And we heard several speakers allude to that. So just very quickly, the macro level issues that I think Prof. Fan spoke so well about and the ADB VP spoke, spoke so well about as well. And of course, the micro level issues. We heard climate change quite a bit, around the degradation, and so on, really. I won't spend too much time on this slide because I rather have more time later on top of the challenges and the, the, the enablers themselves. 
But not, notwithstanding this, though, I think we also need to have a context. And Tom, I like your word. You know, if you look at digital technologies in the context of agriculture, agriculture historically has depended a lot on, on the technologies discoveries that have disrupted, uh, you know, basically practices. Examples on you know, hybrid seed mechanization and so on. So for this particular century, you know, we know that there's been a milieu of technologies that's come about, including the digital technologies. But the question that we really should be addressing to is, you know, is to whether digital tech will be the big disruptor in this 21st century and help us address so many of the problems that we talked about, right? Or uh, more appropriately, you know, what kind of technologies, what kind of digital technologies, you know, should we be tapping given that there's always limited financial resources and also the distance to, to you know, to, 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 to get the farmers as well. Uh, let me offer you a couple of perspectives here. I think the first viewpoint is, is really to ask what are the available digital technologies? And the second then is to look at which parts of the agri-food supply chain or ecosystem best lend themselves to, to, to digital technologies. Now for this viewpoint one, I, I acknowledge the, the, the information from Michael Dean, who several years ago, I thought in the early stages of ag tech and, and digital tech came up with this very nice diagram, you know, on, on disruptive digital technologies. So we're all very familiar today now with sensors, drones, internet of things, blockchain and so on. I, I guess even more recently with robotics, with robots, yeah, and of course, artificial and virtual reality. But at our center in, in the university, we've also tried to frame, you know, the use of digital technology by using this framework here, where we basically look at three aspects. The first is the major aspect, which we've all been, been very enamored with, the production and the processing of food, right, on farm. And then the second part really is the, 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 the actual supply chain itself. It usually meet, the, you know, the downstream, and then the third part, which is all encompassing and stretches the whole value chain is digital finance. Because in many studies, uh, the results have, have shown that smallholder farmers have great difficulties accessing credit. It's one of the major constraints. So this is kind of the umbrella picture that I wanted to share with you. Let me now spend a few minutes just going to each one of these uh, three frames that, that we've used for our analysis at our, our center university. In terms of uh, applications in production and, and processing, you know, I think it's obvious that you know, we go by the, the concepts of smart farming and precision agriculture, which instant, instantly are not new concepts at all. You know, they started in the 1990s, even before then. But in today's world, because of miniaturization and, and digital technology, we've been able to, to come up with things like intelligent sensors, you know, pest and disease management tools, uh, drones that uh, provide analytics to farmers and so on. But I wanted to share in this slide too, that it's not just the private sector, I don't want to give the impression, but the public sector institutions, namely the CGIR centers, for example, uh, on, on the left-hand side of this slide, I've just illustrated two of these on-farm so-called portable decision dates, the ERI rice crop manager, and then the ECRISAR plantings, you know, which allows us to look at uh, identify potential disease issues in a selected number of crops. But underpinning all this and what the farmer is concerned about really, uh, apart from producing more and increasing income, is this whole idea technically of, of reducing yield gaps. Yeah, I think suffice to say that you know, every time the farmer buys a seed or saves a seed, there is inherent yield potential there. And as the season progresses, whether that yield potential is met or not, depends on how he manages the water, the nutrients, you know, and limiting factors and so on, really. So we're seeing things come together now where in the older concept of smart farming, ag, and trying to, you know, up, increase productivity, the tools are now available basically for us to do many of these things and at cost as well, yeah? So this is the part where we talk about production and processes. And, and it's all come together in fact, even in dealing with climate change, the emergence of controlled environment agriculture it's a very important aspect of food security. Here, I just highlight one of these. You know, the so-called plant factories or indoor farms, mainly to grow vegetables. And this really illustrates very well the use of digital internet of things systems. 
to link environmental sensors to cross the decision algorithms, which optimize growth. And, and today, there, there are hundreds of these now in, in Asia, and also more and more in Europe and North America. I just want to, to kind of perhaps note one, which I was very enamored with at the webinar a short time ago, organized by FAO China and Pintuodo, where this company called Hotty Polaris is one of the few examples where you know, a company is using digital twin systems models together with the fiscal facilities to guide optimization of plant growth to grow better tomatoes that taste well and have improved nutrition. So this is just one example of things coming together. And as part of the, the farm uh, operations as well, we're also seeing now robotics coming in. Uh, here's a startup company that you know, was very happy to share with me, a robotic system, which is modular, where you can basically hook up for different applications from spraying to land leveling, but it's all robotic. So this addresses the big issue that we've heard so much about even today, right? the aging population, reducing farm population, uh, drudgery, you know, and how to increase accuracy at scale, all the, the fundamental problems that have plagued scaling up good practices in, in farming. Okay? Let me now deal with the second part, which is really the, the kind of the, the supply chain proper itself, okay? kind of post-production. And this involves the marketing aspects, you know, where we're talking about connecting farmers to businesses, consumers, other stakeholders, and also connecting other kinds of uh, stakeholders to other stakeholders, to the whole system, in fact. And, and here, I, I'm, you know, just again, don't have time to highlight, but I'm sure that our uh, panelists from Pintoda will give you many examples. And I've particularly highlighted that company. For, some, for those of you who don't know Pintoda, you know, it's kind of the Alibaba of agriculture, basically, yeah? very important play in, the, in this new space now of, of e-commerce, e-grocery, okay? and being able to not just do feed forward, also feed back uh, information itself, both ways. Yeah? Now, of course, linked to this, you know, are the usual stuff like blockchain, you know, traceability, uh, e-groceries, install logistics. And, and even, even in non-traditional plays have gotten into the game. I think I just, on the right-hand side here, just show one example of Air Asia. One of the, the first and most successful budget airlines in Asia, you know, initiating this, this platform, e-commerce platform called, called Our Farm, which still operates today and have been very, very helpful indeed under pandemic times, yeah, to, to try and reduce some of the constraints on shipping food uh, from country to country. So this is the second part of, of the frame that we use for uh, analysis in, in our center. Now, Link to supply chaining is another aspect which I think we're just starting to see emerging. Yeah, this is the potential to, to basically look at risk management in supply chains. I illustrate this by just one example that I've been associated with, forming a, a, a food security exchange that helps to develop algorithms to predict risk to different parts of the supply chains, something that's highly germane to the present situation. You know, if we can, in fact, anticipate okay, through, through you know, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, NLP, and so on, we can mine news you know, that comes from different sources and be able to even anticipate some of the disruptions in different parts of the supply chain. Then it's obvious that we can hopefully try and put in some remedial measures. And that, that's the whole area of predictive analytics. And this is just one area that's just starting to, to really emerge, I think, uh, in the whole area of digitalization you know, of supply chains. The, uh, let, let me move on a little bit and talk about financialization because this is the other very key area really, and, and it, it stretches across the entire value chain. I think as somebody else said earlier, you know, uh, financing drives a lot of operations and the availability of funding also drives a lot of progress in technology transfer and adoption itself. Yeah? And of course, at, at a very fundamental level on farms, you know, farmers, abilities to access the market, you know, to, the, to access credit, you know, the, the, the potential of digital payments. And this in recent times are now catching on. I mean, even in, in large countries like India and China, I think we're seeing digital payments for farmers, by farmers, becoming more regular and, 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 and more popular for that matter among small players. Of course, some countries have been much faster because of the enabling infrastructure and in, in, in other, other countries have been. But here's an area where, you know, if, if we talk about collaboration, okay, to, to uplift 
the, the, the uh, hundreds of millions of smallholder farmers worldwide, you know, having access to finance will be a very key part indeed of this whole process of doing so. So now what we're also seeing now, and which is quite a significant development, I, I think, you know, in the past, the, the uh, public sector system, whether it's multilateral banks, you know, the CGR and, and others, have been the main global systems, okay? But we're seeing now the private sector coming in to, to transform agri-food systems along a very holistic supply chain. Okay? And here I want to just illustrate one of them, you know, which is basically a large investment player called, called the Yield Lab. And, and what they've been doing, they encourage the use of digital technology in both agriculture and agriculture, the green and the blue basically. Yeah? And as you can see, they've uh, precipitated and supported startup enterprises along the entire value chain, okay, from inputs to production, the processing, distribution, consumption, sustainability, and so on. Okay? Uh, again, I would urge you, if you're interested, you know, to Google and find a lot more about some of these companies. And they're, they're really illustrative, illustrative of how the pandemic and even pre-pandemic has given opportunities. I think, I think uh, Tom, Tom has used the word agripreneurs. You know, and I use the same term, which for entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs to really have a vested interest in this whole scene here, right? Now, let, let me now move on to the last part of my presentation, given the time constraints, and talk about the ecosystem itself, the challenges and the enablers, right? I think it's very obvious from, from experience so far that digital technologies on their own are not going to, to basically blossom unless there's a supporting ecosystem with enablers to accelerate adoption, especially stakeholders along the entire uh, food system, but in particular, smallholder farmers. What are some of these essential enablers? In some of our studies, and this has been mentioned before, obviously supportive government policies that are translated into regulations and instruments. And the digital infrastructure, I think too often we forget that much of the, the, the rural a world that we talk about in Asia still does not have the digital infrastructure. Government investments, apart from the, uh, the private equity market, yes, government investments are still needed, right? And of course, something that's very difficult to enable, the entrepreneurial spirit, okay? Uh, how do you actually engender that? It'd be interesting to hear some comments from those who have more experience in how to promote the entrepreneurial spirit within the ecosystem. There are supportive you know, enablers as well. And these are the existence of champions, focal organizations. I mean, our surveys have shown that, you know, in, in, in situations, in ecosystems where there are distinctive champions, whether they're farm leaders, uh, political leaders, or se uh, senior government uh, servants, these champions help to accelerate yeah, the, the, the technology development and also adoption. Now, of course, the investments are needed in relevant human resources, in education and training, nothing new there, and then coordinated infrastructure for R&D, commercial enterprise, and the supply chain, especially linking them, the word coordinated really. And then finally, and we heard this several times in the last session, inclusive mechanisms for smallholder farmers. And on that note, I just want to share uh, this next slide here, which are just two examples of inclusive and these are private sector examples, which again, to me, is very enlightening. Because you know, as somebody who's worked in, in, in the public sector most of the time, I mean, the emergence of private sector activities to emulate basically what has been happening in the public sector, to me, there's a really encouraging development, especially in this area of digital technology. You know, just two, two, two uh, startup companies, uh, both originating from India for that matter, Credit AI, which is addressing one of the biggest problems farmers face apart from reducing poverty, blah, 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 you know, it's really how to give access to credit to farmers. How to link farmers who very often don't have the credit base you know, to, the, to the suppliers of credit. You know, to assure that bankers and others, you know, that these small older farmers are credit worthy. And then Faisal, you know, which is the other interesting startup, uh, again, all facilitated by the yield lab, so uh, kind of a private equity, to help farmers increase yield by linking them to IoT systems, in more IoT systems. But importantly though, I think that the take home message here, I think really is that if you look at digital technology and these investments, yes, 
you know, many of them contribute to social good, but also the imperative is to help the poor. And, and, and I, I particularly note the, the, the Prahala, you know, bottom of pyramid principle, and that yes, business can benefit from working with the poor, smallholder farmers. And this has been one of the most important principles that have come along, I think, you know, in, in a modern era from, from the famous economics professor at the University of Michigan itself, yeah? Now, what are some challenges? I've talked about enablers, but nothing comes easy. I mean, yes, there are still challenges and constraints in adopting digital innovation. And hopefully we'll hear a bit more about this, this discussion on this during the panel session, yeah, discussion. The first challenge really is to ask the question, you know, are farmers ready? What kind of farmers are ready? Are they first movers? I will put it that that's one of the biggest challenges we find, to find the right farmers, because there's nothing worse than finding the wrong first movers to destroy credibility in a new technology. And of course, a very practical issue, many of these technologies require energy. Are there sources of off-grid energy? I mean, solar is one that we talk a lot about, but are they practical? Then secondly, the relevance of the innovation. And this is an age old question. You know, is the digital tech solution better than current non-digital ones? What problem or need is it addressing? And there's gonna be good answers to this question. Okay? And farmers, as we all know, are pretty smart people as well in terms of knowing what they need. Yeah? The freedom to operate is an interesting one. It's one, you know, that includes regulatory. And this is one that actually surprised some of us who, who monitor this space, like drones, for example. We do know that in some countries, the use of drones are highly regulated. So the question is, how can you use drones as an environment plant sensing tool? Yeah, because they are quite an important tool in, in many applications, yeah? Then the, the next is, is really this infrastructure. Uh, what I said earlier, in fact, you know, we cannot assume that all rural areas have equal access and equal infrastructure. Telecom ICT generally, and here I, I refer you, if you're not familiar, to the GSMA digital agriculture maps, which I think are really revealing. This is showing which parts of the world at the moment really don't have the infrastructure to support rapid digitalization in agriculture. Then the other issue that we, we actually uncovered, in, in a sense, in our studies, was this question of data harmonization standardization, interconvertibility of data, especially when it comes to competing service providers that use their own data standards. Then the next one is technology affordability and access. Uh, the technology transfer system, which is linked to the next one actually. And then later on product stewardship, the, the after so-called you know, uh, transfer processes okay, that, that are required because some of these technologies are not simple. And that's also where there's emerged an agropreneur class. Like, like in China, for example, we've got young university graduates now running services to provide basically IoT systems, drones, sensors, and so on. But they do provide an after sales service. So product stewardship is actually another key uh, challenge, but also a potential constraint in, in adoption itself. Uh, I just wanted to, to share this particular, uh, one of the ending slides here to make us think a little bit more. You know, we have heard a lot about partnerships, SDG 17, for example, yeah? Now, I personally feel that, you know, as somebody who's been involved in the public sector and also the private sector, you know, that there's, now is the time really to leverage and synergize public private sector investments okay, towards the sustainable de deployment of one important technology, which is digital technology. And in, in, in the process of doing my research, it actually amazed me how so the private sector entities already have the global networks, yeah? So, so, so back to this old, you know, kind of uh, statement about how the whole is more than the sum of its parts. I think there'd be so much more powerful if we can integrate private sector networks into the existing public sector networks, which have lots of experience. The CGIRL, the modern the electoral development banks and so on. But in the end, to serve the farmer, especially the smallholder farmer. Let me, let me just stop, you know, because I've used up my time by just saying that the future is now, really. And, and, and I really want to acknowledge the, the willingness of some of the private sector entities I've spoken to who are willing to share information for some of the examples I've cited here. So thank you very much for listening. And for those of you, for, for lack of time, 
you know, we, we can't end in the, in the conversation, please do contact me. My email address is here. I'll be very happy to end in the further conversations with you on this whole area of, you know, how to accelerate digital uh, technology adoption in, in developing countries in particular. So, so thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tang, for um, a lot of information in a short amount of time, but uh, very good at kind of raising the challenges uh, as well as the opportunities uh, for digitalization and technology uh, in agriculture throughout uh, the value chain. Um, now, to take this a bit further and discuss it, uh, I would like to introduce a panel um, with us uh, here today. Um, and our first panelist is um, a Mr. Uh, Vladimir Stankovic, who is the program coordinator uh, at International Telecommunications Union. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being here today. Our second panelist uh, is Elliot Grant, who is the director and project lead at Alphabet's Mineral X. Uh, and again, thank you for taking the time to be with us today and share your insights. Um, and uh, the third panelist is Vikas Chowdhury, who is a senior economist uh, at the World Bank. Um, again, thank you for being here. And I'd like to uh, pose this question to each of our panelists to get things uh, going um, for a short uh, intervention. Um, can you briefly uh, introduce your organization's views on digital agriculture uh, and what you're doing, um, as well as reflect on the points raised uh, by uh, Professor Tang in his um, presentation? So um, why don't we go ahead and start with Vladimir? Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, and good morning from Geneva. Uh, thank you all for inviting ITU to this important discussion. The work of the Asian Development Bank is crucial in scaling up uh, many solutions uh, already available and also um, in producing the new ones uh, in this part of the world uh, adopted globally as well. Um, at the ITU uh, and um, at the World Summit on Information Society, which is the process uh, coordinated by ITU and other UN agencies. We are really open to listen to ADBs and other relevant partners, including all those present today, on how we can implement um, the existing projects and the technologies on the ground. I believe today's session uh, will shine light on some possible ways forward, and I hope to provide an overview of ITU and VSIS work in this matter. The digital and electronic agriculture using ICT and digital solutions in innovative ways to boost the agricultural sector offers, offers an immense opportunity to improve the livelihood of rural communities in Asia and globally. And as Professor Tang pointed out, ICTs foster sustainable agriculture and drive socioeconomic development while also allowing environmental protection, which as we know and have heard in the previous session today, becomes an even more crucial since only smart use of technology makes the technology valuable. Digital tech innovation has revealed uh, uh, a true potential to transform the approach to all 17 sustainable development goals, specifically the development of strategic framework for digital innovation in the food and agriculture sector will provide a systematic process and sustainable business model for creating testing, funding, and scaling the new digital solutions to achieve the SDGs. The International Telecommunication Union as a UN's tech agency is engaged in several initiatives to facilitate the use of digital technology and improve access to information to create opportunities in agriculture and address some of its most pressing challenges such as climate change, loss of biodiversity, drought and desertification, and bringing impact to the sustainable development. In order for our audience uh, to better understand the nature of ITU's important technical work in digital agriculture, let me start by pointing out the recently launched focus group in ITU 
in collaboration with FAO, which addresses the emerging cyber physical systems as groundwork for standardization to stimulate their deployment for agriculture worldwide, including artificial intelligence and Internet of Things. New standards are required to stimulate the deployment of cyber physical systems in agri tech to feed a fast growing global population. AI, IoT, and autonomous systems can improve the precision and sustainability of farming techniques and enable farmers to make decisions at the level of single square meter of individual plant or animal rather than entire fields of all livestock. Such precision allows well-informed interventions that ultimately improve agricultural sustainability by helping farmers produce more with less. The projection that our planet Can will you please wrap up here for just for the other speakers. Yes, definitely. We'll have so more I'm just going back to the ITU's okay. um, um, uh, work that is beyond just this new activity. And we've been working with its membership, uh, more than 900 uh, private sector, uh, civil society, academia, technical organization membership, producing e agriculture strategies which offer critical support for optimizing impact on digital opportunities in this sector, also producing annual publication series about ICTs for digital agriculture. ITU's platform on using ICTs in agriculture is open to stakeholders to facilitate knowledge sharing. And some of the very successful hackathons have been organized by ITU, including the one in 2018 done at the VISIS Forum the World Summit on Information Society that I would like to um, uh, shine a bit more light later uh, during this discussion and point out that one of the VISIS action lines is on e-agriculture and we would like to invite all present today to join the effort of the VISIS global community. It is a multi-stakeholder inclusive platform where we discuss how Can you please wrap up please. These solutions. Thank you. Uh, next, um, I'd like to uh, invite Elliot Grant uh, to respond to the same question. Uh, can you introduce your organization's views on digital agriculture with reflections on some of the points raised by Professor Paul? Thank you. Certainly. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning, early morning from California. Uh, my name is Elliot Grant, and I lead sustainable agriculture research at X which is Google's advanced research group, also known as the Moonshot Factory. I've personally spent 15 years building innovative digital solutions for the global food system and tackling problems like food traceability, food safety, and, and food security. At X, we look for transformative innovations that can have global impact. And, and I really agreed with Professor uh, Teng's assertion that public-private partnerships are going to be essential in agriculture. And I'd like to mention two specific public-private initiatives that we're doing at X that I think have these characteristics and, and can illustrate uh, Professor Teng's example. So one is work that we actually just announced last week with the CGIAR, uh, which is an organization I think you all know well. Uh, we provided... Um, some of our advanced robotics and, and artificial intelligence applications to the gene bank in Colombia, SEAT, to accelerate the discovery of critical crop traits that could have transformative benefits to smallholder farmers who are growing beans. By accelerating the discovery of um, traits such as drought resistance and pest resistance, using these robots that can dramatically improve, increase the throughput of the discovery. I think it's just a wonderful example of the kind of transformative technology that leverages artificial intelligence. And I think what's interesting about this example, it has indirect impact on farmers, right? We're not asking farmers to adopt robots and AI. The robots and AI are targeted at the CGIAR and that accelerates their impact on millions of farmers. So I think that's one example. And the second example I'd like to give, which I think is illustrative, um, solves for the siloing and fragmentation of agricultural data. Professor Teng showed several examples of 
cross supply chain opportunities and talked about the need for data standardization. And I, I couldn't agree more. Historically, the ag industry has been very siloed. Uh, and so there is a need for this standardization so that data can flow up and down the global supply chain. And to that end, uh, we at X are collaborating with the FAO, the World Bank, the CGIAR, several NGOs and other technology companies like Hewlett Packard, GeoGlam and Digital Green in an initiative that's called OneMap with the goal of creating an open data architecture for agriculture. So um, I'll, I'll stop there with my comments, but I think Professor Tang really highlighted some of the amazing opportunities uh, for digitization to positively impact smallholder farmers around the world. Thank Great. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, also appreciate those two um, clear, very tangible examples of, of how you're taking this forward. Um, okay. For the last panelists, uh, again, the same uh, question. Uh, uh, Mr. Chaudhry, how can uh, you introduce your organization's view on digital agriculture and reflections raised by uh, Professor Tang? Over to you. Uh, thanks a lot, Thomas, and good afternoon, colleagues. I'm dialing in from Jakarta uh, at the World Bank office. So at the onset, there are two things that uh, Professor Paul mentioned. Uh, first one is the supply chain approach, where you are talking about integration of digital technologies uh, all the way from your production, logistics, transportation, to consumption, and the role it could play. And the second one is the ecosystem approach, where you are talking about a large set of players, you know, from your uh, private startups to large agribusiness companies to your fintechs, commercial banks, government entities, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, and the policy and enabling environment that needs to be in place to uh, create this ecosystem around digital technologies. We strongly believe that digital technologies can play a very core role in achieving the targets of poverty elevation and shared prosperity, enhancing climate co-benefits by contributing to resilience and reduced emission, maximize finance for development by crowding in private sector, enhancing gender outcome, and many other SDGs goals. At the World Bank, digital agriculture is one of the cross-cutting agenda that we are trying to mainstream through our multiple operations. In principle, we are trying to do it through three approaches. Number one, by mainstreaming it in our investment lending operation. So as you all know, uh, we are a development financial institution and we provide large scale uh, operations, whether it's a P4R or investment lending operation. And increasingly we are trying to ask a question, can digital technologies play a role in improved delivery of services to the end beneficiaries, whether it's farmers, fishermen, it's a vulnerable population. Can we use digital technologies to better monitor and better implement all of our investing lending operation? And can we start thinking about creative ideas and creative pilots to some kind of subcomponents around scaling up of digital technologies and digital tools. Two, through our policy reform dialogue. We are engaged in policy reform uh, at multiple levels. Right? So I just came back from Ethiopia where we were engaged in a telecommunication reform dialogue with the government of Ethiopia. Now you can't have digital technologies if your broader telecom environment is highly restrictive and doesn't allow you to play a much more stronger role uh, by the private sector. So we were thinking about you know, coming out with, uh, uh, with policy reform ideas on opening up the telecom market for private sector, looking at specific regulation, whether it's around FinTech, whether it's around logistic service provider, whether it's around quality assurance, traceability, and can digital uh, play a big role. 
And third and final point is through our analytic and advisory services. It provides us an opportunity to test out new ideas and new pilots. So for example, uh, we rolled out our Internet of Things in Agriculture pilot project in Vietnam, where we were trying to achieve greenhouse gas emission. Uh, basically what uh, Professor Paul said, uh, precision agriculture, but precision agriculture in a open field condition for smallholder farmer. And can we achieve uh, reduced emission, increased water saving, reduced electricity uh, consumption, reduced power consumption, so on and so forth. And also try to look at the current knowledge agenda that we can push through our analytic and advisory services and see whether that can help stimulate new ideas, whether that can help stimulate new partnership between the public and private sector actors to help create the digital ecosystem. So let me stop there, Thomas, over to you. Great, uh, thank you very much uh, for your comments and uh, joining us today. Um, so uh, we've ended the first uh, round of questions here where uh, you've all had the same question. Let me go back to our first uh, panelist, uh, uh, Mr. Stankonovic, um, and follow up with you with a, another question. Um, in your opinion, what will it take to realize climate smart agriculture for smallholder farmers? Um, from climate financing solutions to digital advisory services, to digital agricultural value chains. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities, but what do you see as uh, maybe two or three of the, the low hanging fruits and, and why? Over. Thank you, Thomas. Perhaps I won't be able to uh, respond from a technical side, but as someone who has been working uh, in the UN system for more than 15 years uh, and uh, part of the World Summit and Information Society team in here in ITU, I would say that um, the forum like this uh, really um, serves the purpose of discussion, bringing together the experts who can respond to uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, very particular questions. One of these uh, events is also the VISIS forum that was launched in 2009, where we have been discussing um, how digital agriculture uh, should be developed, uh, what are the best practices around there, and um, having um, a first time multi-stakeholder process in 2005 launched, the VISIS process has been proven very, very uh, useful for the community around there, especially on those from the ground. Uh, I've seen many questions today uh, in this session and previously on how the small farmers can get benefit from all these solutions and discussions. And I would like to point out that the second uh, important um, uh, act is to really have a meaningful real-time uh, online networking and platforms such as the VISIS talk taking. Another uh, process that has been mandated by the United Nations General Assembly to ITU to collect all these useful, replicable, sustainable digital agriculture solutions uh, and present them and promote them and share them to the VISIS community, which counts more than 300,000 members so far. And uh, I would like to invite all of those uh, uh, interested to not only review, but also uh, use some of these solutions. And of course, to provide back input and feedback on the challenges that they have. Uh, we have been working uh, for many years with the um, e-agriculture community uh, at the VISIS forum and in the VISIS stock taking, collecting these data together. And we are looking also into increasing and enhancing the work on ICTs against hunger at the VISIS Forum this year and beyond. So please uh, come back to uh, uh, the VISIS team in ITU to discuss further these options and opportunities. And we would love to provide you um, uh, as much as opportunity to network with those that you find useful to um, help develop your projects and uh, solve some of the agricultural uh, issues and problems you have. Back to you, Thomas. Great. Uh... Great, thank you very much uh, for your response. 
Um, and next, uh, coming back to uh, Elliot, um, I'd like to ask you, um, in our experience, we have noted the scalability of success, success, successfully piloted uh, digital agriculture solutions seems to be a, a major hurdle. Um, what are your thoughts on how we can ensure that these digital solutions um, remain uh, scalable and accessible? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question, Thomas. And I think, you know, this is not an easy question to answer. Um, you know, coming from California, it's so easy to make a lot of assumptions about the infrastructure that's available, the skills that are available. And I'll go back to Dr. Teng's presentation. He listed multiple challenges to scaling, such as access to you know, uniform power or access to um, telecoms uh, capabilities. Um, and it goes beyond that, right? There's access to fertilizers, access to seeds, access to soil tests. So I think one of the challenges, one of the many challenges we face when we think about scalability is not to fall into the trap of thinking that, that technology is the only solution, right? Technology will rely on many of these other things to always be in place. And I think that's where I've seen many digital solutions fail as you come out with a wonderful app or you know, a beautiful technology solution, but it fails because that farmer cannot have access to the fertilizer that's recommended or the seed that's available, or the internet connectivity is not there in the field where they, where they need it to be. So you know, to answer your question about the, the, um, the scalability challenge and how we make it successful, I think we just have to take a holistic view on any solution that takes into account all of the other pieces of the puzzle that, uh, that a farmer is going to need. Now, it's not all bad news. There are, I'm optimistic that there are some things coming that will solve some of these problems from the technology side. Let me give you a specific example. Um, you know, we've all seen that our mobile phone technology is getting better and cheaper and more capable every year. And I, I, see, I don't see any end to that, which means there's more power in the hands of farmers every day. The other thing that is a relatively recent breakthrough is the ability to run artificial intelligence models, what's called on the edge, meaning we can run our models now without internet connectivity. So imagine being able to push a, a weed detection model or a or a pest detection model to a mobile device when the user is perhaps in a village. And then that device can be taken out to a field without the need for internet connectivity and it will still operate. Those will continue to get better. Those will solve some of the challenges of having universal connectivity. It doesn't solve some of the things like poor roads and lack of insurance. But um, you know, again, I, I think my, my key answer would be any solution needs to have a holistic view of what the user really needs. And actually, if I might, I make, make one more point on this. I think the other failure that I've seen in um, tech solutions is not taking enough input from the local community, right? These solutions need to be locally tailored with local knowledge. And it's, again, I'm, we're guilty of this in California, inventing things here and then pushing them out centrally. Uh, that will never work. Right. We need to develop solutions that can be personalized to the needs of that local community. And over to you, Thomas. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and you're right, it is a difficult issue. Um, and uh, involving the communities in uh, how you go about addressing it, I, I do think is critical because you can identify those constraints and, and figure out uh, how best from their perception uh, to work around them. Um, now, coming back to, uh, because Chowdhury, I had a question uh, for you. You had mentioned uh, PPP a little bit. Um, it was also uh, in Professor Tang's uh, address and uh, Elliot mentioned it. I'm just wondering from your uh, perception or World Bank and it can be IFC as well, um, what are the gaps? What are the best ways uh, that we can address and encourage PPP and digital agriculture? And then what are the gaps and opportunities um, that need to be addressed and exploited? Over to you. 
uh, Sher Thomas. When we are talking about a PPP arrangement, public-private partnership arrangement, uh, one of the first challenges that always comes out is a clear set of understanding between what the private part is and what the public part is and why we need to have you know, both of them together. Right? So when you are talking about the private part, I mean, it's largely the profit motive. Right? Is there has to be a way to make more money uh, for the companies by providing better services, uh, better product. And the reason the public wants to come in is because there is some public good. Whether it's the public good is around uh, reaching the most vulnerable population, whether it's around uh, environmental issues, whether it's around uh, uh, reducing vulnerability to climate change or whatever it is. Right? Mm -hmm. this, so, so once you have that clarity between you know, why we are getting in together, what is the profit motive and what is the public good aspect of this PPP, things become much, uh, much clearer and much robust. The second challenge that often comes across is uh, creeping into each other's areas. So when the public sector believe that they can go along and they can do a lot of those activities using public resources, and the private sector believes that they can go along and uh, deliver these goods and services. And that's where some of the big friction comes in. So, you know, you can talk about whatever example, whether it's your soil fertility improvement, agrometro information, you have a crowded space where both public and private are jostling in to provide uh, various goods and services to the farmer. So there's, there needs to be a little bit of, little bit of uh, clarity on that understanding to say, you know, where, where the public stops and where the private start. And then, you know, gradually, how can the private take much more, much more stronger, uh, stronger role uh, in a given context? And the third part is what Elliot also mentioned in his remark, the whole combination of digital and analog. Uh, digital alone will not solve the problem. You need to provide physical goods and services. You need to have the road infrastructure. You need to have the, the electricity. You need to have access to fertilizer and access to agrochemical and access to market infrastructure. Digital can enhance mm. the efficiency of that physical infrastructure. But if the physical is missing, you know, digital, I'm, I'm sorry, colleagues, it's, it's not rocket science. I mean, it cannot just uh, uh, a leapfrog to, uh, to 22nd century. And that's where a very strong role of private public comes in to say, look, the necessary infrastructure has to be there without which these, these, these services are not going to be scaled up. And the fourth and my last point there would be for public to take a backseat, especially when it's coming to delivery of digital goods and services. I very strongly believe that the private has to be at the forefront of delivering these goods and services. There may be case for public to provide in at a very, very remote location where it doesn't make commercial sense to a particular segment of population where it's not commercially viable still, uh, or maybe providing smart subsidies to crowd in solution for uh, some social goods and some environmental good. But bearing most of those exceptions, I very strongly believe that the private sector has to take lead in delivering goods and services, and then the public needs to needs to crowd out uh, and give space to private to deliver those services. Uh, so those were four points. We are trying to uh, help address this PPP arrangement through our engagement in number of countries, and happy to talk about that more later on. Thanks, Thomas. Great. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your response. Um, we are running a bit short on time here. Um, so we did have one uh, question that uh, that came up and I, I'd ask people for a very short, uh, less than one minute intervention here. 
Um, but I think it is a, a, an interesting question. Um, is uh, COVID, with COVID-19 and, and also the recent uh, Ukraine-Russia Ukraine -Russia conflict has just shown us how vulnerable logistics value chain should be. Um, should digital technologies try to globalize uh, agricultural value chains uh, further, or should it try to localize agricultural food systems? And um, we'll start with you, Vladimir, and again, a very concise uh, response, please. Well, definitely the pandemic has demonstrated the urgent need for digitalization and accelerated the shift uh, toward innovation and uh, digital transformation to harness more digital economies. Um, a recent study that ITU has done uh, in the sub-Saharan uh, region has proven some of the um, takeaways, key takeaways that could be you know, really useful for other regions. And this really includes uh, the low levels of digital literacy and inadequate research and limited capacity development. Uh, to further constrain the advancement of um, the digital transformation in the agricultural sector in the region. But also, um, uh, we need to enhance the key digital infrastructure, such as access to electricity and reliable network coverage and access to digital devices. So I think, uh, going back to the question, I think we have to take um, um, a solution from both ways and see how we can uh, work in through global partnerships, uh, such as as 17 or this is section line 18 and bringing it back down uh, to the you know uh, uh, you know the scalable solutions that really um, are going hand in hand uh, with the uh, uh, fintech and uh, financing digital agriculture uh, through you know um, micro loans uh, and other solutions um, uh, hubs startups um, private pub private public uh, partnerships that can really see uh, the, uh, and understand what is happening on the ground through, through, through meaningful research and trying to go back uh, providing uh, solutions that finally uh, have been uh, implemented elsewhere and need to be uh, replicated, uh, adjusted, and um, you know, presented uh, in a sustainable way. OK, thank you uh, very much for your response. Um, so I would ask the, the same question um, to Elliot about this uh, focus on globalization and uh, food chains uh, as well as um, then local production. Um, if you could give your mm -hmm. thoughts on that, please. Sure. Um, I think I wouldn't frame it as an either or proposition. I think this is a, que a question of both and and the role of technology in my mind is one of optimization. How do we use technology to come up with the optimal solution? Uh, because I think today we don't have enough information transfer, to, for example, to spot supply imbalances early. And again, I'd, I'd like to give a concrete example of some work uh, we did with the CG of early detection of um, a failure of a crop to emerge. The ability to do that with technology means we can more quickly move food, for example, for food security where it needs to be. So I don't think this is either about being more global or more local, but rather to, to reduce the inefficiencies that exist in the global supply chain. Great, uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, fully agree with your, your answer and also uh, viewed the question similarly, but... Um, and we can possibly do things that would satisfy both, as, as you indicate. Um, and to finish that out, um, Mr. Chowdhury, can I, can I get your views, please? Uh, sure, Thomas. Uh, again, my, my views are very similar to Elliot. Uh, globalization and localization are part of this, two part of the same coin. What this phone has done is reduce the information asymmetry. And that, that for me is the biggest power. Previously, you know, I am a small farmer sitting in India. I had no idea what's going on in other places of the world, where the markets are going to function. What kind of fertilizer should I put in my, my crop, a piece of land? 
Should I harvest today? Should I harvest three days later? Should I sow today? Should I sow it later? What disease is going to come? How would I, what chemicals to apply? Can I use some kind of other, uh, you know, non-invasive, non-chemical mechanisms to manage that? Digital technologies have the potential to change that. At a click of a phone, uh, by sharing messages on WhatsApp, by getting all the agrometer information, soil fertility information, I can now act. And by acting, I, as a farmer, can either make more money or save some of my expenses and produce much more uh, products, uh, whether it's for global market, local market, or whether it's for uh, global market. You know, that, 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 for some extent, from a farmer perspective, is immaterial. Uh, so that, that's, that's what I would say, Thomas. It's, it's part of the... Uh, localization and globalization are concurrent themes. They are going to continue to run. But the biggest uh, advantage that we have now is the removal of the information asymmetry in some ways. Over. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, interesting answer. Um, but there is a lot of power, and as noted, more and more power each day in the, uh, the mobile phone which hopefully we can uh, harness. And as also you rightly said, uh, with a big focus on the income and livelihoods of the farmers. And uh, hopefully this technology will help us get there. Um, I would like to thank everybody for the uh, panel. And um, with this move to the next section of the program, uh, where we'll have a several presentations, um, and then Q&A from the audience to discuss. So um, firstly, I'd like to introduce um, Mr. Uh, Don Tan, who's the Director for Corporate Affairs at PIN Dodo Dodo. Um, and uh, can you please uh, go ahead and uh, give your presentation? Thank you. Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Let me get my share my screen. All right. Okay. Uh, I think everyone can see my screen. All right. Thank you, everyone. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'd say that rural development and food security are very important intertwined issues that need our attention to benefit all stakeholders. And therefore, at Pinduodo, we are very happy and honored to be here to share our perspectives on it and how we have been applying digital technology for agricultural and rural development. Um, for the previous segments, I think uh, a lot of the things that you've raised are also things that we have been looking at. So we are very happy to be here to have a good discussion and to learn from everyone present about what more we can do and how better we can improve how we do it. Sorry. Okay, let me begin by giving you a short introduction of my company, Pintuoto. So Pintuoto is China's leading agriculture platform. We connect over 850 million consumers directly with over 16 million farmers. In 2020, which was the last year that we had this full year statistic, oh, we get a new number soon, of course, the total value of agricultural products transacted on our platform was about 42 billion US dollars. This was about 16% of the total value of products transacted on our platform. So I think it's very fair for us to say that we are quite committed to harnessing technology to improve every link of the agri-food value chain. And this is why we launched the 10 Billion Agriculture Initiative last August. So our plan for the 10, agric the 10 Billion Agriculture Initiative is to put our quarterly profits towards addressing the critical needs in the agricultural sector and rural communities, and for its central goal to be the advancement of agri-tech, the promotion of digital inclusion, and giving agri-tech talent and workers a greater sense of motivation and achievement. So I, I would say that a huge part of what we do, uh, to understand what we do, has to come from understanding where we came from. And for us, agriculture has been at the center of our business from our day one in 2015. So our start was by bringing agriculture, a sector that touches everyone's daily lives, into the digital economy. So there were and still are many practical challenges, I'd say, with bringing agriculture into the digital economy. 
Uh, first, like many of you have mentioned, there's a high degree of atomization in this sector because 98% of farmers in China, they work on smallholder plots. And many of these smallholder farmers, they are not digital natives. In addition to all of this, these things, there are some genuine issues uh, with agri-food value chains, which is the perishability, because perishability is a challenge when the existing infrastructure is built and optimized around non-perishable goods like electronic goods, white goods, and stuff that place lesser demand on speed, on cold chain technologies, etc. So for a lot of other e-commerce platforms at that point in time, we were founded in 2015, it was just not worth, worth it for them to try to enter this sector because there was rapid growth that they were enjoying with other sectors. And so this gave us our opening. What also helped was like some of the speakers mentioned as well, uh, that in the 2010s, the mobile internet wave was sweeping through China. So we had the opportunity because consumers were often on their smartphones and we developed a mobile only e-commerce UI that upgraded the user experience that reintegrates the fun of shopping at a Sunday market. So this led us to the two defining features you see on the slide. First, I think uh, on the left side that you see, it's the feed-based user interface, which mimics shopping, shoppers strolling and seeing products as they go through the market and they interact with shop owners like while they're scrolling because they can actually click on stuff, ask questions, and then the storeholders do reply. And second, um, it would be the social online shopping experience with our team purchase that you see on the right. So how team purchase works is with a few taps. Users can share about products with friends and form teams to buy them at better prices. And these better prices are offered by farmers and agri merchants who actually see certain value in doing so. So all of these features trigger a virtual circle or rather two virtual circles that are concentric as more users come in because they have a better experience and they enjoy better prices. And then more merchants come in as well and farmers come in as well because they can sell their products faster to a bigger audience. So all of these together actually makes e-commerce work for agriculture because as we know, agriculture's average order value is lower, more perishable. So a lot of things like transport cost um, and, a lot, and a lot of atomization would have a very deep impact on how some of these things can um, make or break, I would say, this whole value chain. So um, a lot of talk has been about digitalization. So I would just quickly go through some of these topics, which is that I would say that for us, internet and agriculture helps us to streamline the distribution chain and provide transparency, both forwards and backwards. Um, by applying, because of doing so, I think farmers get better access to, and consumers get fresher products at better prices as well. So let me illustrate this with the garlic example, or uh, an example of garlic farmers from Henan province, which is one of the major garlic exporting regions within China. So traditionally, garlic that is sold in Henan actually passes four layers for, uh, to reach the consumer. So um, the garlic actually starts with the farmer who gets who sells it to the off-taker. The off-taker just determines the price. And then after the off-taker sells it to the regional wholesaler, it goes up to the central like distribution area and then it goes down again to the retail outlets and distributors and then the consumer gets it. In this whole process, there is about an eight RMB, eight times markup because the farmer only gets two RMB per kilogram from the off-taker who just determines the price. And then the, the consumer pays about 16 RMB per kilogram. So this is like an eight times markup as you see on the, on the, on the slide. So with Pintoto, what farmers do is that they can set up an online store on our platform and they set the prices that they want to set by surveying the market. So they can see what the other garlic farmers are setting, right? Uh, and in this case, they price their garlic at about four RMB per kilogram. So after deducting the additional processing cost of like packaging for e-commerce, blah, 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 they make 2.6 RMB per kilo. So this is a 30% increase in income for them. And farmers and consumers who buy the garlic at about 4 RMB per kilo, they save 75% per kilo. And their garlic is also fresher. With this whole process, we actually also cut down the distance of um, transportation distance, storage, and distribution timings. So food loss and waste is cut by about 25% from production, which is much lower than the global average of 40% of food loss and waste from the production level, especially for fruits and vegetables. So while the concept is clear, I think for internet and agriculture, it is a lot of work to make digital agriculture work or agricultural digitalization work for all. And this is central for us because it is important to make it work, especially for farmers, so they will keep coming back to sell. 
And to make it work for farmers, you have to make sure that they earn. And when they need, you need to make sure that they earn in a sustainable way. And once it is sustainable, they can kind of invest more in themselves and then invest more in better processes manage, and, and, and managing stuff. So we organize promotional activities like you see uh, on this slide to raise consumer awareness, appreciation, and demand for agricultural products. So in this way, what we are doing is that consumers will come back uh, for more and more stuff. They appreciate the stuff more. They may be willing to pay more for special products. And then this incentivizes farmers to actually invest more. And we actually help farmers in this way to raise their incomes and through this raise their livelihoods and raise the sustainability of their production. So this is to us another part of the virtual circle that we are helping out with. Moving along, we also developed the Toto Grocery and Toto Grocery is a system which connects local demand and local supply in less than 24 hours. So just to put it simply, Toto Grocery was started in August 2020 uh, after with the COVID-19 in the backdrop. So what happened was that we noticed that as more and more consumers were going online to buy agricultural products, there were certain breakdowns, or not breakdowns, but there were certain bottlenecks uh, in the delivery process. So we thought about a way to make a more resource light system uh, to, to fulfill this demand. And also there are other benefits that came along with it. So with Total Grocery, what we do is instead of a usual platform service that you see, we curate groceries by pickup location. So consumers actually put in where they live or where they want to pick up their items from. And we match them with nearby agri merchants. So based on the postal code or whatever that they put in, we actually offer them a certain list of curated items from nearby. So orders placed before 11 p.m. will be fulfilled at a pickup point that they can walk to by 4 p.m. the next day. So it's less than 24 hours. So what we are doing by shortening the fulfillment time and eliminating last mile delivery is that we are reducing resource requirements and costs, unblocking logistics bottlenecks. And I would say we are allowing consumers to buy even more products at better prices. And they also get to buy a wider variety of even more perishable items. So like in the pre two slides earlier, I mentioned garlic. So garlic, to be fair, is a perishable item, but it's not as perishable as, for instance, cilantro or coriander that you see on this platform. So now we make it possible for them to do so at a good price. And when we are doing so by cutting out last mile delivery, which is about 30% of delivery costs in China approximately, um, we are making the product more affordable. And through all of these processes, we actually also make it more sustainable for the environment because Sometimes some demand can just be fulfilled from nearby instead of from far away. And I would say this is the benefit of having a network like this as well. So of course, all of these things, we can say that we are innovating at the level of the downstream, but moving to the midstream, we also are working uh, in, on agri-focused infrastructure as well. Because like I mentioned earlier, we have observed that infrastructure is not really designed for agriculture exports, uh, uh, for agriculture sales to fulfill the demand and supply. So we think that this is something that we need to change as well, because if there's a lot of food loss and waste, there's a lot of income that is lost for farmers. And it's not just the income, it's the loss of nutrition and nutrient, it's the loss of productive resources. And we know that we need to be more sustainable. And therefore, as a system, we need the agri-food system to be more sustainable. So we also need to kind of solve some of this issue so that we don't put in resources that go to waste. So, for us, agriculture is big and unique enough, and we are investing and working with partners to expand warehouses, sorting facilities, and smart route planning systems that reflect the real-time resource availability throughout the network. So just to clarify, I would say we do not own our own logistics service providers. We are very fortunate that the system in China is one where this system is completely developed or very, very developed, and we can tap on third-party logistics service providers. But we kind of know where they are. We know what they're doing. We, we will do it in such a way that deliveries are efficient and we help to cut down on idling time because actually a lot of cold storage idling. Can you try to actually... wrap up, please? Thank you. Sure. I'll wrap up soon. So that is one of the things that we are looking at. So, of course, um, also addressing some of the other things that the panelists mentioned, we have Total Academy where we work, our, we work with farmers who are the backbone of our agri-food system. We pay a lot of attention to upskilling them through courses to teach them about e-commerce. We do so through Total Academy, providing e-commerce and store operations courses to over 590,000 farmers. And we work also with new farmers, tech-savvy young people who are returning to rural areas who already know some of this tech. And then we support them to start their agribusinesses. We are quite proud of them as well. And then to Total Farm. Total Farm is one where we spoke about uh, private-public partnerships, PPPs. 
I think this is one of the examples where we have a tripartite partnership where we work with agronomic institutes and local governments and farmers to actually help them to plant better for the environment and for themselves. So on the right side of the screen, you see Toto Farm in Yunnan, which is actually in the Nutiang Gorge area, which is a high altitude area. We noticed that actually citrus farm, citrus fruits, um, I would say they are seasonal. That's something I didn't realize because I live in a tropical country myself. Um, so we help them to pick a variety that is, we, we work with the agronomists, agronomists to pick a variety that, uh, that, that is right, that ripens off season so they get a better market. And then we work with them to bring in new technology like irrigation from Israel and new techniques to trade, we train them in them. And then they produce the same yield with less fertilizer, 15% less fertilizer and 30% less labor. So this, this is one of the success cases for PPP that we also hope that we can share with others as well. So we also have a smart agriculture competition, which where we try to get young talent to actually do more uh, and find that there is a career for them in agriculture because agriculture is something that we need we need it to be sustainable in the sense that we need the young people to actually um, be able to find a career in this and continue doing this into the future. And we are working on some of these techniques and we have this competition where we get them to actually work on solutions. And they have some of them have commercialized their solutions and worked with farmers. We, and we need to move on, please. To yeah. So uh, just to quickly finish off uh, the slide, we started our 10 billion agriculture initiative. And then I hope that I can continue speaking with all of you more about what we do. Uh, with our project uh, in, in, in the, the Q&A. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation and, and great examples of uh, really how this is at a very uh, small scale uh, in terms of the farmers and the consumers, but also um, has being exploited for uh, very large uses as well. It's a, it's a really interesting uh, presentation. Next, I'd like to... Um, introduce uh, Mr. Otini Mpengajira, who is the program lead in Precision for Development digital, digital Projects in Odisha, India. Uh, Otini, the floor is yours. Thank you, Thomas. Good afternoon, all. I, uh, as mentioned, my name is Otini. So to quickly start, uh, firstly, let me apologize if there's any background noise. I'm in a field office and so it can't be avoided. But my presentation today is going to primarily focus on raising some thought questions for you all on you know, what it is like to implement a mobile phone based customized advisory service for smallholder farmers. Uh, um, particularly when those smallholder farmers are less digitally able and to do this at, you know, at significant scale. So this will be my, my presentation, a very quick overview of our, of, our, of our organization, and then I'll deep dive into our project here in Odisha. So our mission generally as an organization is to close uh, the information gap that our smallholder farmers and other poor peoples across the world see in any of you know many of their activities, but specifically in agriculture. As an organization, we have now reached about 5.7 million farmers across the world in about nine, 10 countries, uh, of which about 5 million of those we're actively serving today. And so the, the challenge that, that's in front of us is is very well understood. And I think a lot of the panelists have really hit the nail on the head here. Within the agricultural value chain, there's inefficiencies in multiple components, but one of the, the underlying currency is you will, as you know, if you will, is this information asymmetry, be it you know, where and how to access inputs all the way to where and how to sell their excess whenever they've got a bumper harvest. And so our opportunity in the digital space, particularly in the countries where we work, is that mobile phones are continuing to increase in prevalence. You know, in India, for example, between 60 to 80 percent of our adult populations own a, own a, own a phone. Um, and at the same time, we've got increasing awareness of who our farmers are and what they do. And so together, this allows us to provide and to close this information gap. What distinguishes us as an organization and our model is not just the low cost nature of mobile phone and technology, but also the fact that we continue to keep the farmer and evidence at the center. And 
with our partners, we strive really hard to ensure that the service that we, we are providing to them is free uh, at the end of the day. So very quickly, um, our service that we provide in Odisha is a build, operate, transfer service. It's a partnership between ourselves and the Odisha uh, Department of Agriculture and Farmer Empowerment. When we look at Odisha, about 69% of our farmers grow rice. And you know, this is the main crop, as well as all of the other crops that they, or livestock that they, they rear or grow uh, from season to season. Yet a significant proportion of these farmers, about 25%, have yields, uh, rather, sorry, a uh, significant proportion of these farmers have yields that are about 25% less than the national, uh, the national average. And there is a definite uh, gap between what they're producing today and what they could potentially produce within their specific fields. Um, when we've looked at what information farmers have for their agricultural practices, we note that they don't have uh, the opportunity to supplement their knowledge, either access to services like ours or within traditional um, extension systems enough that they, you know, they uh, they don't uh, change their practices for timely planting and growing, uh, better response to uh, pests and other adverse conditions, and so on and so forth. So, in addition, we've taken a model that we trialed uh, and optimized in another Indian state in Gujarat, as well as in Kenya, to come together to build this build operate transfer uh, program. Today, we're serving about 2.2 million farmers across all 30 districts, and we have partnerships uh, with multiple organizations, of which our key supporters are the government itself, the BMGF, as well as JPAL South Asia. What does this service look like to the farmer? As you can imagine within digital, we really can fall into the trap of, you know, the most exciting, the most cutting edge of the technologies that are available to us today uh, from, you know, satellite based uh, weather systems, algorithms, and so on and so forth. But not all of this is available to the smallholder farmer. And so we have to ask the question, you know, what do they have access to in their hand today? And so this is this question between feature phones versus smartphones. For Odisha, we realized that the vast majority of our farmers today or when we opened held feature phones uh, and we didn't let this step stop us. We instead built an IVR based service. Uh, this is um, interactive voice response uh, based service where by dialing uh, the government short code 15233, farmers can register uh, with that registration, provide some of their own demographic information that we can use to customize weekly advisory but also through the same uh, number, they can either talk to uh, an agent so in a live call or just use the IVR service to record a query about agronomy or government schemes or weather about anything. And then our system will get back to them within a 24 hour period. So that's it really with, uh, with regard to what the service looks like. And now I'd like to share some of our key lessons from you know, the challenges in terms of building it and operating it. And now we're in this phase of transfer. So when we really think about building uh, a digital service to close information gaps, at the minimum, we can look at, you know, look at it from three components. One, we need you know, information about who the farmer is, who needs this service. Two, we need to be able to put together all of the existing agricultural technology. And in this case, I'm, I mean agronomic information um, and be able to really know how to target it. And then three, we need to be able to deliver it. So from an, an implementation point of view, when we're talking about who the farmer is, we really have to be asking, you know, what information do we have available? In our case, we're partnered with the government. And so there are some databases we could take advantage of. But even within that, we have to ask what form and quality uh, that information is in it, is in. And 
for all of you out there when you're getting started, you know, are you in a place to take advantage of similar information systems or are you starting from scratch? And, you know, uh, how does this affect, you know, your startup uh, costs as well? When we're talking about generating precision recommendations, we're really talking about what the advisory landscape is. Um, as an organization, you might be able to come with a specific value add, be it in research, be it in agronomy, be it in technology, but ultimately you're acting uh, within partners and it might not be the case that you also have a research network which is testing different seeds and different weather conditions within your geography. And so what we've taken advantage of here in Odisha is to work with our government partners, as well as the university, IRI, uh, CGIRR, uh, and others who have research in the field uh, through which we then know, okay, this is what is uh, best to communicate to our farmers within their specific agroclimatic zones, uh, and so on and so forth. Finally, when it comes to communicating to farmers, we're then asking the, you know, the questions that are key to the technology itself. As previously mentioned, we quickly realized that we couldn't use, you know, smartphone applications to reach the vast majority of our farmers when we got started. And instead, we had to put together a system that could reach them through feature phones. At the same time, we also couldn't build large uh, server farms and that sort of thing uh, within the comp confines of our government premises, you know, being uh, them being our partner. And so we had to uh, come up with solutions as well. Okay, time Moving check. On. Yep. Moving on. When it comes to operating the service, technology really is, is super great, but it really isn't uh, the end all of it. Um, I think one, one of uh, the panelists mentioned that, you know, Genuinely, the user has to be the, the center. And at the same time, the service itself, the technology itself cannot replace the existing extension or the physical systems, but rather it must augment them. Okay. And so as we have built our system, that very simplified chain, if you will, actually grows a little bit into a simplified chain 2.0 where we're incorporating uh, feedback mechanisms, as well as uh, very purposeful components for iterating and optimizing the system at hand. And so you can look at iteration in multiple ways. Uh, one of them is on the technology. Okay, we need to wrap uh, up soon, please. Apologies, I, I will do that uh, very quickly. So we can look at it from the technology. For example, is the menu comprehensible to the farmer? or we can look at it with, re with regard to the message that's being delivered. Just to summarize quickly, all of the components at which you can iterate on your existing service uh, come together to produce impact for the farmer. So very, very quickly, we are also in a, in a place where we have to hand over this project. And so some of the questions that we have to raise and have been raising with our partners is, for example, what a transition actually looks like. Is it replacing us and the technology or is it simply replacing the funding uh, of the project uh, and so on and so forth. But yeah, apologies for not being able to go through everything. Uh, I will end here. Thank you. Thank you very much and I appreciate uh, the cooperation with the time, but uh, people can access the, the PowerPoints. But uh, again, a very interesting presentation conceptually on how you, you go about this and, and thinking about designing one of these uh, 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 systems. Uh, uh, next, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Jawa Ku, who's a senior research fellow uh, at uh, IFPRI. The uh, floor is yours. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks and hello everyone. Uh, so yeah, my name is Zhao Ku, a senior research fellow at the Environment and Production Technology Division at the International Food Policy Research Institute. So in my presentation, I want to shift gear a little bit uh, to look at the policy level and high level decision makers, what kind of challenges they might face when they want to uh, harness the technology for better 
uh, risk management in climate and market, for example. So uh, our institution is working on um, the research-based policy solutions. Um, and yeah, one of the things we do in this division and this institute is looking at the potential technologies. So I, I'm going to share a little bit of uh, lessons learned and also what kind of challenges we ourselves faced and what we uh, want to share and so that we don't have to uh, go through the same kind of mistake, okay. Um, yeah, so I will just quickly skip this slide. Uh, so yeah, I think we, we saw a lot of opportunities already and uh, for the challenges at this uh, level, the policy level, I, I wanted to quickly touch on those three things, the digital divide, inadequate information and limited capabilities. And I will discuss uh, exactly what it means in practice uh, by not addressing those challenges. The first the digital divide, um, the potential of digital technologies uh, is clear, uh, yet each reach is not universal. And rural communities are often underserved and underrepresented in information systems. And this can create biases in data, in inaccurate information, and even misguided decisions. And I'd like to quickly show you an embarrassing example that we learned about this uh, hard way. A few years ago, we had a project that needed to understand the relationship between market access, kind of distance to market or the time it takes to the market, and the level of adoption or level of adopting agricultural technologies like improved seed. Uh, we, we did not have much time or resources, so we wanted to quickly use um, cell phone kind of SMS based survey uh, across the country. The result was reasonable to some extent. Um, the farther you are from the market, the level of technology adoption decrease or uh, drop to a certain level. However, we found that uh, the adoption level started increasing and it increased so high in very rural areas. And can you guess why? Uh, we tried really hard to understand why this pattern happened. And we tentatively discussed that maybe farmers in rural areas are fully committed to agriculture, so much so that they are adopting technologies. And we even found uh, similar evidence in other literatures as well. Uh, but the reality is that we were really wrong. Um, the, this was happening because in rural area, uh, because of high price of cell phones and low level of connectivity, uh, people who can afford to own a cell phone is the only people answer our, uh, our survey, and they are the ones better off and can adopt the technologies more. So yeah, again, the, the lessons learned here is that um, yeah, you, you really need to have a good strategy for collecting data and ground truthing, uh, ground truthing information and data to validate your finding. Yeah, otherwise uh, you may fall into the trap of not representing and not fully really understanding the challenges and underrepresented population, especially in rural area. The second challenge area I wanted to mention is inadequate information. There are many information systems already in place across economies. Uh, we even started hearing that some countries have too many information systems and they need to be better coordinated. Evidence shows that, however, weak information systems with inadequate information are still waste budget and exacerbate poverty and slow economy growth. Um, existing knowledge is not always useful and they might, not, they might be outdated or difficult to apply in practice. Uh, here is another set example that uh, we analyzed uh, last year, we published it last year. Um, this was the story about 2015-16 El Nino, um, which, which caused a lot of problem uh, around the world. Uh, in this case, uh, of December 2015, FAO issued very scary early warning uh, that uh, Southern Africa will face a uh, severe drought. Um, at the same time, a Zambian government issued a precautionary export ban on maize grain uh, to protect their local food supply and food security. However, in reality, what happened was uh, the extent of drought was very, uh, not very severe and uh, not very uh, wide. Uh, drought was only recorded in the southern part of the country uh, and most other part of the maize growing producing, maize growing area uh, actually recorded normal or uh, above normal rainfall, and they actually produce more maize than they could have done, uh, they could have produced in normal years. 
However, because the export ban already in place, uh, they couldn't export or they couldn't really bring it to the market of other countries or uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, to seize this opportunity. Um, so, and government actually didn't have this information uh, flow a uh, channel into the decision-making process. So uh, government actually didn't leave uh, this uh, export ban in, in time. Uh, so at the end, what happened was, um, and we, we actually saw that this information was already available. The weather data was keep updating. And yeah, as Elliot mentioned, the satellite data keeps showing, you know, the earlier early warning was not correct, but yeah, this really didn't uh, change the government policy in time, in timely manner. And at the end, what happened was that because of the export ban, uh, price deepened, uh, price was depressed, and then uh, actually poverty increased um, at the, uh, as a result. So uh, the, what we learned here, the silo data really do not uh, support evidence-based policy. And uh, this is especially a problem uh, to manage this fast changing uh, the climate, climate patterns and climate shocks and weather, uh, weather shocks. The last one quickly is the limited digital capabilities. Um, even if you have good infrastructure and state-of-the-art technologies generating new data and information, uh, you also need to uh, you also need ability, ability to understand them and use them in decision making uh, effectively. Uh, technology investment should be complemented investment in soft skills as well. And this is particularly important, important for marginalized food insecure communities and especially women in food system. Uh, here, I wanted to share another example that we actually, <laughs> again, failed to realize these important lessons early on. Uh, back in 2020, uh, we started a research pilot uh, to see the value, to test the value of the state of our seasonal probabilistic uh, climate forecast data. Uh, this data Time set- check. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, this data they provided very detailed six month forecast uh, of the wet rainfall and temperature. We, we thought we had a crystal ball and we can really uh, make this data useful. Uh, in this map, uh, you are seeing uh, in uh, almost uh, one or two months in advance, uh, we predicted, uh, this data set predicted that there will be large scale drought coming in India. Uh, so we allotted our uh, the partners you know, on the ground and they kind of wanted to prepare for the drought. But what happened in May 2020 was the historic flood uh, that caused uh, enormous damage in properties and even caused death. And the, the twist of this story is that in fact, the forecast was not wrong. Uh, we, we already had data and scenarios that predicted flood. Uh, but when we were analyzing the data, we only took the median value of the probability distribution that happened to be uh, on the course for drought. So yeah, in this case, again, we uh, researchers were not really fully uh, understanding how to interpret the data. Uh, we could have done better job uh, and um, you know, generating the right kind of insight uh, timely uh, to our stakeholders. So you know, again, uh, what we learned here is that there are many exciting technology pilots out there keep generating new information, but you know, unless we are uh, involved in how to use that information, how not to also interpret the data, the correct way of generating the insight and delivering to the right partner. Uh, yeah, we might even uh, keep developing pilots that do not scale or, or misguide decisions. So they're just word of caution here. I thank for your attention and I will come back for Q&A later, thanks. Great, thank you very much. Uh for that presentation about uh, that also highlights uh, the challenges of trying to take this uh, forward. Um, for the last presenter, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Takeshi Ueda, who is a principal natural resources uh, and agricultural uh, economist here at the Asian Development Bank. Uh, Takeshi-san, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tom. Let me just show. Thank you. Uh, I just hope to uh, acknowledge uh, the uh, people who uh, contributed to this presentation. Uh, my colleagues from Department of uh, 
DENR, Environment and Natural Resources of the Philippines, and also Department of uh, Trade and Industry. Um, this uh, presentation is all about uh, ICT application to uh, sovereign or public project management. So uh, the context is a bit different from what has been presented. And I, I think it's uh, also interesting angle. And uh, uh, so let me just start. Uh, four types of uh, technologies uh, used for this project management. So, right. Uh, let me start with the project profile. Uh, this project is kind of extraordinary project, uh, working with uh, like so many uh, households in a very, very widespread area. I mean, maybe 15 times as large as uh, maybe Singapore. Uh, it's quite wide area and uh, they are all scattered in different islands. So we were uh, having this uh, kind of a challenging task uh, in order to improve livelihood uh, through improving natural resources, especially watershed area. Uh, so that's our uh, project purpose. And uh, there are three uh, kind of components. First one is uh, integrated watershed management and investment planning. And second is actual physical investment in rural infra or livelihood support. And lastly, building capacity uh, for local governments, as well as uh, communities and uh, agencies, uh, multiple agencies involved. Okay, uh, let me just uh, talk about this lady. I mean, she is one of our uh, beneficiaries and her name is uh, Ms. Cecilia Ofo Ob is part of the indigenous people's organization. She's living up high, a very high mountainous area and uh, um, located in mountain province. And there is such province called mountain province in the Philippines. So she's one of the active women's organizations member in uh, this Coderiala administrative region. Uh, it's up north in the Luzon Island, if you know the Philippines. And uh, uh, okay, so uh, we are supporting six he 16 hectares of reforestation subproject and three hectares of agroforestry subproject. And uh, they are so happy to receive this project support. And uh, she goes to mountain with colleagues uh, 365 days. Uh, every day uh, from a uh, whole day working in a mountain. And they are so happy to have livelihood. Okay. And their motto is all for one, one for all. Okay. Uh, let me introduce this first applica uh, ICT application. Uh, this is GIS-based integrated project management information system. And uh, uh, this is the tool uh, to manage uh, project uh, carries information of geographic data and various project activity information and implementation status and procurement of goods and uh, works and services. So this really uh, kind of made project management easy. So this is uh, one of the uh, picture uh, generated from that system. So you can see how scattered uh, these areas are in this uh, Philippine map. Okay. All right, this is the information about uh, each subproject. Where is it? How much is it? What is the uh, site, uh, I mean site size and how much progress it has been made. And we have a lot of uh, visual aids. Uh, so, uh, you know, each subproject we do have this kind of picture profile, and uh, uh, some of them are uh, connected with geotag. I'll show you next. Yeah. So uh, in the site, uh, farmers or local government officials can capture that area uh, by taking photo, 
and with specific coordinator and a time. So uh, this can be used for project reporting purpose as well as uh, project monitoring purpose uh, because these areas are quite hard to reach. So this uh, significantly help project management. So this is the uh, application uh, you can download in the, uh, your mobile phone. So these are uh, forest activities. And this abaca is the fiber uh, used for uh, clothing or uh, different types of textiles. And uh, uh, next one is uh, commercial nursery we are supporting uh, for forest activities. And in addition, there are various uh, livelihood supports we are providing. So these are examples. So drone, uh, for this project, drone was very useful because we really need a wide area uh, to be covered and monitored and forest activities. So looking at from top uh, is really useful. So this is banana citrus and banana lansones, uh, one type of tropical fruits, uh, these cheese. Similar pictures. Okay, all right. So uh, this one is combination of geotagging and uh, uh, picture taken by drone shot. There is application uh, which can make kind of uh, connection to it. So we can have a kind of picture file, and then a specific spot. Uh, we can have this geotagged uh, photographs to see up close. Uh, lastly, this is e-commerce. I mean, uh, the, they are living in a remote areas and it's difficult for communication. And also uh, they cannot provide sufficient supply to you know, put on, for instance, Alibaba uh, in the Philippines, uh, it's Shopee or Lazada. So uh, government helped to set up this uh, application which can be commonly you know, accessed by community people. Uh, it's a sim simple system, and uh, uh, we engage uh, local uh, logistic companies, and uh, uh, we use different payment channels, uh, Gcash uh, provided by the government to online payment um, through bank, and uh, so we're using all sorts of different uh, digital solutions. Okay, and certainly capacity building was the important portion uh, of the project. I just uh, finished here. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Takeshi-san. Um, we're running very close to the end of the session. Maybe um, we have one or two questions here that, uh, one for uh, for Dantan is um, based on the the lessons from China's e commerce. Um, how applicable do you think this is for some of the countries in Pacific region, uh, such as island nations or others, where logistics are a constraint? What uh, uh, what's your views on how this can be addressed? Uh, Don, over to you. Yeah, so thanks a lot for the question. And I think I'll take this question together with, I think, a few of the other questions that I saw that were related to the work that we do. Um, first and foremost, like I mentioned uh, during the presentation, uh, we are fully aware that we are a company that uh, operates only within China. So we wouldn't dare to say that we have the answers or the solutions for people in different, in different situations from ourselves. But there are certain elements, there are certain variables or inputs that we see that are quite important uh, to make e-commerce work the, the way that we that it has worked for us. And we are very fortunate that there was a good uh, infrastructure system, there was a good mobile system, and there were already established uh, payment services or mobile payment services that we could tap on. So where these services are coming to play, and I would assume that as mentioned during the discussions earlier, like where the PPP comes in, this would be very useful. Uh, so it has to happen with some of these right elements around, and it would depend very much on the situation in that area. 
the other question that was also posed uh, to me was regarding, um, I think, uh, how to, 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 sorry, let me see that question again, which is quality control assurance mechanisms and stuff like that. The main thing to know is that, cons that farmers and agri merchants on the platform, they are not fly by night. What they do is that they want to set up a genuine proper business. They want to make it sustainable and they want to grow the business as well. Uh, which means that they that that is one element of it, which is where they start from. The other part is that there's a lot of interactivity, like in a Sunday market model through our mobile only uh, platform, where consumers actually can give feedback to storeholders. Consumers can also give feedback to friends and so there is a certain reputation that they have to uphold and, and build, and they know that if they destroy it, then they'll be in trouble in the future. So that's not what they want. So it's, it doesn't serve them. Uh, the other part of the puzzle, of course, is this is about consumer satisfaction. The other part is about education. It's about uh, knowing what the food, whether the food they eat is safe. And that's something that we are also looking at. So in August, 2020, we actually launched a research partnership with the Singapore Institute for Food and Biotech Innovation uh, to develop cost-effective tests for contaminants throughout the process. So consumers can do some of the testing themselves to know about contaminants in the foods and fruits and vegetables. And uh, with that, we hope that there'll be more peace of mind because we want consumers to have peace of mind when they shop with us. Otherwise, they'll just not shop with us in the future. So it's a very self-sustaining thing. It's a very, it's, it's something where we always look at trying to create virtual circles. Okay, that work okay, for the okay. And the Let's get to some of the other questions yeah. for the other panelists. Thank you. Um, Otini, there was a question for you is, um, how are you encouraging um, the farmers to use the digital tools that you're um, putting together, and uh, can you share any experiences with that? Sure. Um, I think so. First, firstly, we should recognize that at, at the very least, the Amakrishi service that we've built in Odisha is is not the you know the quintessential digital form that we might think of generally. So a lot of our farmers are not on smartphones; they're on feature phones. And so they are essentially, from their perspective, using a service that uh, looks like any other government helpline that they would call. What's different in this case is everything else that we have built behind it. And so what we've done to encourage usage and to encourage or to sensitize farmers of the differences of this IVR line is sensitization through the government extension network, as well as, you know, mobile, uh, TV, newspaper, radio advertisements. But we've also been fortunate that our, our government is fully bought in by you know, the minister, the department directors and so on. Each time they speak about a new government scheme, they mention, please call into this number if you have questions and to access other, other services. Great, uh, thank you very much. Uh, for that uh, uh, response. Um, I think in the interest of time, we are going to have to stop here, but I would like to uh, request uh, the participants uh, in the audience uh, to participate in a brief poll that we'll conduct right now um, that will be done through Zoom. So I would uh, ask the uh, organizers, and there it is right there, and appreciate your cooperation in uh, filling out the, uh, the evaluation. And then um, following this, uh, we'll give you a bit of time and um, we'll have a synthesis session for, uh, to conclude uh, the first day with the round table and the, the, this first technical session that will be um, presented um, by uh, Mr. Shingo uh, Kimura, uh, who is a senior uh, agriculture specialist uh, here at ADB, and uh, Navin Tarakavi, who is also with the ADB and a uh, senior agricultural specialist here. Um, with that, I think we can close, but I would like to thank uh, all of the presenters once again for um, really interesting presentations on uh, giving us a lot to think about it, but also highlighting kind of the, um, the different opportunities, but the challenges in, in taking this forward. 
Um, I, uh, with that, I will turn it over to Shingo. Shingo, the floor is yours. Okay, Tom, thank you very much. So uh, my job is to summarize the, this discussion at the first session of leaders forums. And I'm not going to summarize all the uh, you know, rich discussions. And, uh, uh, but here I have just take a uh, few takeaways uh, from the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the message we received in the session. Uh, first at ADB's uh, Vice President Kasani and uh, IFA's Associate Vice President Mr. Brown presented key challenges we face for system, food system transformation in the region and then their presentation set a, a scene for the preceding discussion at the forum. And we had a very lively discussions uh, with the uh, key leaders in the regions, uh, Shengen Fan, Yutaka Arai, and the Kao Duk Fat. So I would say uh, we learned, uh, uh, I think I would take on uh, three points. Uh, first, um, you know, we all agree that we are again uh, in a perfect storm conditions uh, in global uh, food markets, driven by high energy prices, COVID-19 related uh, disruptions, and uh, ongoing this Russian-Ukraine uh, conflict, and of course, more extreme weather events happening all over the world. So we need to manage all these situations uh, well, and we have lessons actually learned from the previous food crisis uh, the lot of uh, speakers emphasized the importance of open and transparent uh, trade, which are playing a key role here. And we also need to monitor the global market situations. Uh, but also it's important to look at uh, the evolution of local food security situation at the country or sub-regional level, uh, because it's situation is very different depending on the countries. We really need to monitor the situations of our developing member countries for the next uh, you know, six to 12 months very intensively. And uh, uh, we must be ready to provide uh, timely and effective social protection measures. Um, the, some of the speaker in, uh, emphasize the importance of enhancing local capacity of producing healthy and nutritious food uh, in addition to this uh, in importance of global trade. The second point uh, in the medium to long term, uh, many speakers uh, agree that uh, climate change uh, imposed the uh, major challenges to food and agriculture sector uh, in the regions. And the sector will be suffering more from more extreme weather events uh, but also uh, the sector play a key role in the climate change mitigations. So they em emphasize the important role of technological innovations, uh, but also call for more integrated and coordinated policy responses. So we need financing mechanism, uh, policy interventions, uh, research and development, and capacity building at local level to promote climate smart agriculture technologies. Uh, just pick one point, Professor Fan also emphasized the opportunity of exploring a carbon credit market to allow farmers to get return from the adopting climate smart agriculture technologies. Uh, lastly, uh, all, all of the speakers uh, call for a platform of knowledge sharing, uh, including government, private sector, international organization like us, also the non-governmental organizations on this food system transformation in the region. So that response from all the parties are aligned and uh, uh, collaborate with each other. In particular, Vice Minister uh, of Japan's Minister of Agriculture, uh, Yutaka Rai expressed a high level of expectation to ADB and also uh, high willingness to work with ADB and the other uh, DMC government uh, to, to support this uh, regional uh, food system transformation. So we will have more opportunity to discuss these key issues in the next uh, few days from various aspects. We already had a very lively discussion on the digitalization issues. 
And uh, I hope we can elevate the discussion of our partnership with different uh, organizations uh, present today. With that, I will stop my uh, summary of the session. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Shingo. And now over to you, Navin. Thank you, Tom. So uh, to synthesize the digital technology for agriculture session we just had, I just uh, put, I put forth a few points. And the first thing that came across all the speakers, the panelists and the keynote speakers, we need to take a problem-driven approach to digital technologies for agriculture. I think uh, often solutions that will potentially disrupt our, our food systems may, be lying, may lie at the intersection of public sector, private sector, and uh, agriculture uh, sector players. So, so we need to uh, always keep, them, keep this in mind. Uh, there's a need to promote uh, digital solutions for scaling good agriculture practices. So if that means that we can introduce a low-cost robotics uh, to, uh, to a smallholder, we should, we should definitely uh, try to see the feasibility of it. In agriculture value chains, there is a need to enhance the transparency. That means uh, we need to allow free movement of data, financial services, and knowledge across the supply chain. So there needs to be effort on the direction. And uh, while we need to look for solutions that directly disrupt farmers and value chains, um, as uh, uh, one of our panelists, uh, Mr. Grant, uh, pointed out, we uh, can also look for uh, approaches where we can indirectly disrupt by supporting research institutions such as CJR, um, come up with better seed varieties and or come up with better ways to uh, manage uh, the crop and so on. So um, there is also a need to support um, globalizing value chains, uh, supply chains, at the same time promoting local, local agri-food systems. And all the speakers uh, described the need to keep farmers' uh, skills and capacity at the heart of designing digital solutions, um, Pindudu, um, and precision development, as you know, for example, highlighted those aspects. Uh, ground reality largely determines the success of the solution. Therefore, empathy for the ground reality uh, needs to be considered at all times. So that came across in all the experiences. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, as uh, Professor Tang uh, uh, mentioned, um, uh, crisis is becoming the new norm. So we need to um, explore use of digital technologies to address food security directly. So he talked about food security exchanges. And um, so, uh, so that's another area we, um, we have to uh, uh, work in the future. So we look forward to, um, as uh, Shingo uh, mentioned, uh, elevating this discussion in the next few days. Thanks, everyone. Back to you, Tom. Thank you very much, uh, Navin, for uh... A good summary of what we just discussed. Thank you very much, uh, Navin, for the the summary there of what I thought was a, a very interesting and, and useful uh, session. Um, I understand now we have some videos that people uh, can stay and watch. These were produced for the um, for the forum and. Uh, uh, address uh, some of the issues we're talking about. Um, but otherwise, with that, I'd like to again thank everybody uh, who participated, the panelists, uh, all the speakers, um, and especially uh, the participants who uh, joined us uh, for this uh, session, and um, encourage you uh, to come uh, for the other technical sessions. And if we did not get to your questions, we will try to respond by email. Uh, but with that, I'd like to thank everybody um, for participating and joining us today. <laughs>